Amen. Find in your Bible the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And today we're teaching on the subject of mothers. Happy Mother's Day. Today from Luke chapter 1, I want to talk to you about this subject, the miracle mom. The miracle mom from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. So happy Mother's Day. I hope that you are planning on a great lunch with your family afterwards and Mom, I hope you didn't have to cook it all, okay? I hope that you have an awesome and exciting time planned. Not only is it Mother's Day, but today I begin a series entitled Home Improvement, a series that will take us from Mother's Day to Father's Day. And in this series, I'll be talking about moms and dads. I'll be talking about children, how you can obey and honor your parents. I'll be talking to single people, finding the love of your life, or what does it mean if God desires you to be single. I'll be talking to, uh, to, to moms and dads as you parent, raising children. We'll be talking about marriage and all sorts of things over the next seven weeks. And so I want you to make sure to adjust your schedule, make your plans to be here between now and Father's Day. Today, I I want to talk to you about Mother's Day, the miracle mom from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to verse 55. But before I dive into the text, I I wanted to show you something that would really make a point, that would really, really hit home. And so I found this video And I thought we should just all watch this video today. This little kid knows a thing or two about moms. Take a moment, look at the screen, and check out this video. This one goes out to moms. On behalf of all the kids in the world, here are two things every mom needs to know. Number one, put down your phone. Unless your kid is named phone. Number two, don't name your kid phone. That's just not right. That's messed up. Number three. We love you. It's just sometimes we don't know how to say it. Sometimes it just comes out screaming or crying. But the next time your kid screams, you know what they're really saying is, I love you, Mom. You're beautiful. Thank you for not naming me phone. (laughs) Four, stop cleaning. Our house is messy. Our house is awesome. It's awesome because we live in it. My mom got stuff to do. Number five. Mom upside down is wow. Doesn't really mean anything, but I just thought it was really cool. Wow. It should be like this. Wow, 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 wow. Number six. Wow, I have you here. I want to take a second and talk about meatloaf. Meatloaf's like a loaf of bread, but it's meat. Mom, we love you, but let's cool it on the meatloaf. Number seven. Thank you for cleaning up all the poop. Number eight. Have fun for once. We love to see you have fun. Thanks for the grocery store. Uh Uh-huh, I found all this stuff. Or sing in the middle of a driveway. It'll feel great. And then it'll scare your kids so much, they'll be quiet. Number nine. Hug more, shout less. Look, I get it, I get it. Sometimes we do some things wrong. But growing up is scary. There's school, there's tests, there's telling times with clocks that have hands. There's tying your shoes and kilograms and kilograms. Kilograms? I don't know, it's hard, but that's why I go to school. It's just hard to grow up. Sometimes we just need moms. Moms to tell us everything's okay. Number 10, the secret to changing the world, moms. Without moms, none of us will be here. Moms, kids love you, 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 mm-hmm, and you. If every mom in the world knew how awesome they were, every problem in the world would be fixed. From kids everywhere, thanks for believing in us, putting up with us, and straight up loving us. Mom, you keep us dancing. <laughs> All right. That's, I don't know if you know, that's Kid President. You can find him on YouTube. Kid President on YouTube. Obviously, he loves and respects his mom, right? But here's something he knows. He knows that his mom is not perfect. In fact, today, we're going to talk about that. There's no such thing as a perfect mother. And I hear the collective gasp in the room. There's no such thing as a perfect mother. Listen to what he says to his mom. Put down your phone. Stop cleaning Hug more, shout less, cool it on the meatloaf, right? He has all kinds of advice for his mom. 
He knows his mom isn't perfect. And today, no matter how much we want to honor and appreciate and, and, and respect our moms, we're not giving out an award today to the perfect mother. She's not here. They don't exist. And so it's interesting as we come to Luke chapter 1, we're going to study one of the most famous moms in all of history, Mary, the mother of Jesus But I want you to know, as we come to Mary and her life, she wasn't even the perfect mom. You know, there's never been a perfect mother. There's never been a perfect mother. Now, now there is a church, a denomination that teaches that Mary was, that she lived in sinless perfection. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Mary did sin. She was not perfect. In fact, Mary was a mortal, a human being just like you and just like me. She falls under that category in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So she wasn't perfect, but look, she wasn't a perfect mom, but she was a miracle mom. She was miraculous. She was miraculous because God had a task that he assigned to her and she obeyed that task and God did something great in her life. And so you're not a perfect mom. You probably already know that and so do your kids and so does your husband. We just don't say it. We know better than to say that, okay? You're not a perfect mom, but you can be a miraculous mother as well. God chose to use Mary in some incredible ways extraordinary ways. Let's dive into the text, verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. Mary's just found out that she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. How would you respond if God appeared to you and said, hey, by the way, your kid's going to be president. Your kid's going to cure cancer. Whoa, big deal, right? Well, listen to how Mary responds. When God has spoken to her and told her that she will be the mother of the Messiah, the mother of the Son of God. Verse 46, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's looked on the humblest state of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud and the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Remember this morning, the power is in the perfect word of God. No, Mary was not a perfect mom, but she was a miraculous mom. And today this room is full of moms, of ladies that are not perfect, but you too can be a miraculous mom. I mean, let's be honest. Moms are miracle workers anyway, right? Right? Yes, moms are miracle workers anyway. They're not perfect, but there should be no discussion about it. They are miracle workers. With, with one kiss, that boo-boo is all better. Thanks, mom. Like with, with just a few minutes, last night's leftovers become this brand new dish for dinner. Awesome. With, with just a minute to spare, she gets everyone to rehearsal and recital and practice. And, and most moms, a lot of moms do this while juggling a job and crazy husbands like me and lots of kids. Congratulations and thank you. Most amazing miracle to me is how a mom has anything in her purse. Anything is in her purse. And the thing is, if you go look for whatever she says is in her purse, you will not find what she says is in her purse. Doesn't matter how long you look or how many times she says, it's not here, it's there. Trust me, it's there. And she knows right where to look. What? a miracle. Today we'll dive in and we'll talk about Mary, but we'll also talk about how you as a mom can be part of God's miraculous plan and God's miraculous purpose. So what's it look like? How can you be the miracle mom like Mary was a miracle mom? Number one, you've got to recognize God's goodness. Recognize God's goodness. 
God is good. He's loving. He's faithful. Now imagine Mary. Imagine that you're Mary. And you've been chosen for this specific task. You are scared. You're intimidated. You know you've never been with a man. But you're about to be a mother. Not just any mother, but you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. You are going to bring into the world the Son of God who's been promised for decades, for centuries, and for millennia. Imagine how you would feel. Look back at Luke chapter 1, verse 30, and we'll read to verse 35. As God gives Mary these instructions and this announcement. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. You're going to give birth to a pretty important guy. The most important guy in all of history. Verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called, will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, how would you respond as a mom if God appeared to you and gave you an announcement like that? But I noticed something very interesting in our text. And what does Mary say? She asks a question. She asks this question, How can this be? How can this be? This is a way of saying, why me? Now, I want you to hear this. Everybody needs to hear this. This is a way of saying, God, why me? How can this be? Why me? Because there are two ways to ask that question of God, why me? Sometimes, and most of us have asked the question this way, God, why me? Why are you allowing me to suffer? Why am I facing this difficulty? Why am I struggling with this? God, why have you put this on me? God, why me? And and a lot of times we ask it in a complaining way. But then there's another way we ask the question, and I think this is the way we all ought to ask this question. We look to God and we say, God, why me? Why would you choose to love me? Why would you choose to save me? Why would you allow me to be a part of your plan? Why would you allow me into your family? Why would you call me to serve you? When I look at who I am and who you are, I'm blown away that you would even choose to use me. This is the way Mary asked this question in humility. God, I don't understand. Why me? Why this servant girl, this poor servant girl? Why her? Well, the Bible says she found favor in the Lord's eyes. Mary chose the second way. She chose to ask in humility, God, why me? And she chose to worship. Look at verse 46 and verse 47. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. By the way, if you've ever thought or wondered if Mary was perfect and sinless, she answers the question herself right here in verse 47. What does she say? My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. What are those two words? My Savior. Who needs a Savior? Sinners need a Savior. Mary says, I rejoice in God, my Savior. She's worshiping the Lord. And there are two ways here I want you to know that you can recognize the goodness of God. First of all, you are part of His plan. You're part of His plan. As you look at God's goodness in your life and His faithfulness, I want you to recognize part of His goodness is that you've been allowed to be a part of God's plan. Look at what she says in verse 48. He's looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. My soul rejoices and worships the Lord. Mary admitted her need for a Savior. And then notice how she describes herself. She describes herself in a humble estate. Now that doesn't just mean that she's poor. She was. It doesn't just mean that she was young. She was. It doesn't just mean that she didn't really have a whole lot of prospects for her life. She didn't. What it means is here she is living in a situation where society around her, the nation of Israel is falling apart under foreign occupation and rule. And here she is. She says, 
The Lord has looked on the estate, the humble estate of his servant. Can I give you a prerequisite for being greatly used by God? Humility. Mark it down. If you want God to greatly use you, first, he must greatly humble you. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up. The Bible also says the pride he will bring, the proud he will bring low. Pride comes before a fall. Mary is humble. You can be part of God's plan in humility and gratitude and appreciation. Look at what she says for, from now on. All generations will call me blessed. And what does Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 28 say about a faithful and godly mother? Mary says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Proverbs 31, 28 says, of a faithful, godly mom, her children will rise up and call her blessed. Blessed under the favor of God. You're part of God's plan. Secondly, you should give God praise. So how can I recognize the goodness of God? You are a part of his plan, and as a result, you should give God praise. What does she say in verse 46? My soul magnifies the Lord. In other words, I'm giving God glory because of his goodness in my life. The word magnify is an interesting word in the Greek. It's a word you'd recognize. The root word is mega. Mega. You've heard that word before. Mega means big. Well, in the Greek, it means to recognize greatness or to make great. Mary says, I'm going to worship the Lord. I magnify him. Now, when you use a microscope, you take something that's very, very small and you make it larger so that you can see it. When you use a telescope, you take something huge but very far off. And you look through that telescope and you can see something huge and far off and it brings it closer and near. I want to tell you how we magnify the Lord. We magnify the Lord not like you're looking at the microscope. You magnify the Lord like you're looking through the telescope. And the Word of God enables us, like a telescope, to see God who's great and mighty and powerful and majestic and far off through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. God, this great and mighty God, comes near and close to us. And as we magnify Him, we don't make Him great. We recognize His greatness. You couldn't make him any greater than he already is. We recognize his greatness and his goodness. You should give God praise. Look, look at what she says in verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Listen to me. If you're here today under the sound of my voice, the mighty one has done great things for you. He offers hope. He offers salvation. He offers rescue and redemption. The Mighty One has done great things. In 1937, Walt Disney released his first full-length feature film. Many of you know what it was. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This was a gargantuan task for the Disney crew. Disney artists drew over one million pictures for that movie. And each picture would show on the screen for one twenty-fourth of a second, 24 frames per second, over a million pictures. As we watch that movie run at regular speed, it seems so simple. We have no idea all that goes into it. And I want you to know that our lives are like that movie. That every day, God is working in powerful and amazing ways. He is painting a picture to write his story in your life. And he pays such close attention to all the detail, to, to every little piece and every little spot. But as the frame flips, you can see his faithfulness, his love, his providence, and his goodness every single moment. That's the way God works in your life. God is a good and faithful God. We should recognize His goodness. And moms, let's be honest. Sometimes we get a little too busy to recognize God's goodness around us. All of us do that. 
And, and for you moms, sometimes his goodness may be disguised. It may be hard to see. It may be covered up by dirty diapers and messy rooms and a loaded sink full of dishes and a laundry room that's hard to dig into. But his goodness is everywhere. If you want to be a miracle mom, you've got to take a moment and recognize the goodness of God. Number two, rely on God's strength. Recognize God's goodness. Number two, rely on God's strength. God will give you strength. I don't have enough strength to be a parent. I don't have enough ability in my own. On my own strength, I have nothing. God gives you the strength. You have to learn to rely on his strength. Now, I have to admit, I'm amazed how strong my wife is. She's strong. She does crazy things like run and do spin classes and she lifts weights. She lifts weights. She's strong, right? When I'm like, hey, help me carry this, but let me get the heavy part. She's like, I got this. She can lift it with a finger. Don't tell her this. She could probably beat me in arm wrestling. Like, she's strong. But no matter how strong you are, there's a strength that's always greater than you. You know that? No matter how strong you are, God's strength is always greater and you need his strength in your life. God's strength is always stronger. Look what she says in verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Verse 51. He's shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. She's saying, God, and you notice that she says the strength of his arm. She says, God is mighty. She's talking about how good and how strong God is. She spoke of his arm. She was going to need God's strength now more than ever. She was going to be a mom. She was going to need to depend on him more now than ever. She looks to his strength and his might. Mary says, he who is mighty has done great things for me. I love how she describes God in this verse. He who is mighty. No matter what you face in life or what you encounter, I want you to understand that you serve a God who is mighty. You serve a God who's strong. You serve a God who can handle whatever you face. Did you know that God is strong and mighty? We teach our kids that song. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God can't do. And then we live our days as if the song is not true. We think that he can't handle whatever we face. God is strong and mighty. We need to learn to rely on his strength. A father was watching his son through the kitchen window. His son was playing in a sandbox, and in the sandbox there's this big rock. He watched his little boy as he tried to lift that rock. He watched the little boy. It felt like hours. It was probably just a few minutes as the dad watched him lift that rock, and then watched him turn around to the other side and try to lift that rock, and the boy could not lift the rock. And then the dad watched as the little boy finally folded his arms, sat down on the rock, and then put his hands over his face. The dad walked out and said, son, what you trying to do? He said, daddy, I'm trying to move the rock. He said, have you been able to move the rock? No, daddy, I cannot move the rock. Son, have you tried your best? Daddy, I've tried my best. I cannot move the rock. Son, have you used all the strength you have? Yes, dad, I've used all the strength that I have. The dad looked at his little boy and said, you haven't used all the strength you have because... You haven't asked me to help. I think sometimes in life, we feel like we run out of strength. But it's because we're not relying on God's strength. We're not leaning on Him or even letting go and allowing Him to do what only He can do. The the song says so beautifully, His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He will carry us when we can't carry on. That's the kind of God that we serve. Take a moment and recognize the goodness of God, but also rely on His strength. I'm sure there are days, Mom, when you feel like you can't go on. There are days that if you could find the return counter for the kids, you'd be there in a moment. I know. I understand. But there's a strength that you need that you don't have in and of yourself. You need to depend on God's strength. Number three, rest in God's promise. So we need to remember God's goodness. 
We need to rely on God's strength. Rest in God's promise. God has given you great, amazing, and incredible promises. Rest in His promise. Not only is God good, not only is He strong, but God keeps His word. Have you, maybe this has played out at your house before. Have you ever made a promise to your kids that you fully intended to keep? But for whatever reason, the situation turned into, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep this promise. Sometimes this, this may be how it plays out. One of your kids in the morning says, hey, can we play this game? And you say, well, we can't play the game right now. We'll play the game tonight before we go to bed. But then tonight comes and you've run late at church or ball or practice and, and everything's going nuts and it's time to go to bed. And the kid says, hey, you said we could play the game tonight. And you're like, I know that I said tonight, but I didn't know what tonight would be like. So let's play the game tomorrow. Maybe that's never happened to you. There have been moments and times in our lives where we make a promise or we give our word and it doesn't quite work out like we planned. Can I tell you something? That never happens with God. Amen? That never happens with God. God never says, oh, I didn't know, or I forgot, or I didn't really mean that. It never happens with God. God always, always keeps His word. He always keeps His promises. Here, Mary recognizes that she serves a God who's faithful to his covenant. Look at what it says in verse 54 and 55. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. You can't find one promise in the Bible that God has not kept or does not intend to keep. God keeps his word The nation of Israel in this situation had fallen on hard times. The majority of the Jews lived in what was called the diaspora. It was the scattering, the dispersion of the Jews because of persecution. The homeland had been invaded repeatedly. And now Herod sat on David's throne. Can you imagine how the Jews felt and how Mary must have felt? For four centuries, God had been silent. But now he was about to speak and about to act in a way he never had before. The divine treaty that God had signed with Israel was unconditional. And God was going to keep his word. Mary recalls God's covenant. Look at what she says in verse 55. As he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She is recalling. The promise that God made in Genesis chapter 12. The covenant that God made with Abraham. She's recalling the goodness of God. And she says all the way back to the beginning of the nation of Israel. God has kept his promise. And he's not going to quit now. God is going to keep his word. Verse 55. Circle that word forever. It's emphatic in the Greek. It's Placed there for emphasis. Mary understands God's promise is not just to Abraham. God's promise is not just to his offspring. God's promise lasts forever now through Jesus Christ. So the promise is for you and for me through Christ. Today I want you to know no matter who you are, where you are, what you've experienced, God has a promise for you. I found this this week and I thought I'd share it this morning as we conclude. Seven promises for every woman on Mother's Day. Number one, for the mom who needs to know that she isn't on her own. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 11, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. You are always God's beloved, especially on days where you might feel empty, And poured out. Number two, for the woman who longs for the comfort of a mom. Isaiah 66 and verse 13, as a mother comforts her child, God says, so I will comfort you. Fold yourself into God's arms. He loves you. He knows right where you are. Rest in him. Number three, for the woman who's left home or family to follow God's plan. 
Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, no one who's left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. Sometimes we have to let go of our idea of family in order to become part of what God intends for our family. Number four, for the woman whose heart longs for a voice to call her mom. Psalm 113, he makes the barren in the house as joyful as the mother of children. God made you to be life-giving. He honors your pain. He'll make something beautiful birth inside of you and bring life to others through you. Number five, for the single mom who's carrying the fears and emotional weight of parenting alone. When Hagar was abandoned by Abraham and sent away to fend for herself, all alone in the wilderness with her son Ishmael, she cried out to God. And the Bible says in Genesis, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle of water and gave her son to drink. God feels the fear in your heart and he knows when you're overwhelmed and he knows just what you need emotionally and financially to take care of you, to take care of your child or your children. He sees you and he will never abandon you. Number six, for the mom whose child has passed away or whose mother has passed away. Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age and the gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I've made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. God will carry you and hold you and comfort you. Number seven, for moms of all ages who are letting go day by day, to launch their children into the world. Whether there are five going to kindergarten, 18 going off to college or in high school, 28 and ready to be married, 30, 40 something starting their own families or fulfilling their lives or callings of living in singleness. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 127. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the woman whose quiver is full of them, they will not be ashamed. Our children don't belong to us. They're a gift that we give back to God and a gift that we give to the world by launching them out like arrows in the hands of a faithful archer. In the end, there is no such thing as a perfect mother. Maybe there aren't perfect moms because we know there aren't any perfect kids. But ultimately, no matter what you're facing, no matter what situation you find yourself in today, you won't be perfect, but you can be a miraculous mom. Like Mary, who was called by God, available, obedient, and faithful. I'm going to ask.